and welcome welcome to this first panel of a long series of appointments we will have to go deeper into the concept of digital transformation and this is exactly the first step we're taking today about this very first panel about understanding digital transformation uh, i'm michele di paola will be the panel moderator for today together with me there is limonas which is in charge of all the technical aspect and Maya, which is coordinating all the background stuff happening uh, inside and outside our social media platform. And there is this, which is going to do the graphical recording for the day, but um, we have also our panelists and we have Kadri and Enrique from Salto uh, Participation and Inclusion and, uh, sorry, Participation and Information and Inclusion and Diversity. So I'm going to give them the floor now so that they can tell a bit more about the process which is starting with this uh, first panel and it's going to take us uh, through a long, long ride until next April. Uh, Enrique Kadri, please. Hello, thank you, Michaela. Hello and welcome everyone. Um, I'm very excited uh, to see this uh, panel starting today as the first one in the series of uh, panel sessions on digital transformation. Um, and uh, the process for this or how we got here has been lasting now for two years since uh, digital transformation was announced as a new priority in the EU youth programs. And we have been working towards this uh, for a while uh, separately and together, looking into the youth program programs, looking into the youth work field generally. And, uh, and now we are here uh, to go more practical, hands-on, and it's uh, great to have you with us on this journey. And uh, yeah, I will go give a word over to Enrique. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Enrique and I work for Salt Inclusion and Diversity. Uh, yeah, the interest of, of our uh, resource center in, in the topic of digital transformation, study especially with the COVID-19 pandemic. And we were, yeah, since 2020, uh, also particularly looking at uh, how the pandemic uh, was affecting young people with few opportunities and how that was affecting the mobility uh, activities in, in the youth programs. So we did some research, we did um, some mapping, tried to reach out to uh, youth organizations that were also adapting to the new circumstances and then seeing how the digital transformation processes were affecting on a positive and, and also negative ways the, the learning mobility activities uh, with young people with disadvantaged backgrounds. Uh, and then at some point, we uh, also got to know the work of SOTA participation in the field of the digital transformation and we joined forces and we realized that uh, at that stage, we already had quite some uh, contacts and, and, and resources and information and it would be uh, really excellent if we could find ways to, to share them also with the, with the fields. Uh, and then the idea started for a series of trainings. Uh, and then we also got this idea of the, the panel uh, sessions. And uh, yeah, it was really important for us also to bring a multi-angle perspective on this field. Also looking at uh, outside the EU uh, youth programs and see how we can, can learn and inspire the sector. And so really, really excited to now when I look back and see how the, the process started and I'm seeing that now we are here in the first panel is about to start and uh, it's also the kickoff of, of the long-term project so it's really exciting to see this happening yeah thank you Enrique and Kadri just a little bit of yeah I don't know gossiping or giving more context we see the two of you being outside somewhere so it's nice if you maybe want to share which is this somewhere so that we understand where you are 
Yes, uh, we are currently in Armenia in, in, a, in a town called Gyumri. Uh, we are in the Salto network meeting that happens uh, usually once a year in a physical form uh, where all Saltos meet. At this point, we have, let's say, 7 to 11 Saltos uh, in Europe that are supporting the EU youth programs. And uh, yes, it's, it's really nice to be here. The weather is great. Uh, and uh, yeah, <laughs> maybe you would like to add something. No, yeah, at the same time, in just the room next to us, the other colleagues are discussing uh, how the new constellation of, of Saltos will work together because there will be also Salto um, Digital coming up soon. And uh, so there's also quite some changes and a lot of uh, exciting things happening mm -hmm. in the network. And we are somehow now skipping that part a bit, but we also, of course, join in a moment the discussions. And um, yeah, and in this cycle of activities that we also uh, uh planning now on digital transformation uh, they will culminate with the study visit which is precisely in armenia and we uh, later today will also discuss with the host how we actually will practically implement it so many things overlapping uh at this moment very good thank you as always i would say but yeah we are starting the process leading us to armenia you are already there in armenia in advance maybe the colleagues from the uh, up to come uh, digital salto is or are going to watch the session as well to understand what's happening here but uh, it's time to explain it to everybody and to the people uh, who are watching us live uh, streaming on the different social media platforms we are streaming this panel on so it's time to introduce our panelists. So our guests for this first panel about understanding digital transformation will be Dr. Alicia Pavluchuk. Hopefully I'm pronouncing the names correctly. Uh, digital inclusion thinker and doer. Her research and community practice are grounded in democratic participatory experimental and interactive methodologies. Key areas of her expertise include digital youth work, digital inclusion, gender digital inclusion and digital literacies. In 2021, Alicia co-authored the digital transformation definition uh, while working as a strategic consultant at Salto B. Dr. Pablo Suk is the founder of Digital Bees, a digital inclusion collective exploring the intersections of research, art, and community education. Welcome, Alicia. Thank you so much for having me. Hello. Hi, hi there. And moving on to the next guest, Mateusz Hoffman project manager in Deeper Network, developing its participation at local level, a European platform of over 80 civil society organizations and local authorities from more than 30 countries that aim to involve young people in decision-making processes at the local level with particular passion for digital world. He is engaged in several international projects that connect you to participation to digitalization through digital tools, e-participation, games, and gamification methodologies. Welcome, Mateusz. Hello there. Perfect. Then we have Martin Fisher, media and game educator, bringing together digital culture and youth work. His main field of work are video games and as an educational tool, as well as digital participation for young people. He's currently working in the project Canvas City. The website is gocanvas.city, which is using a augmented reality game to introduce topics of algorithm ethics, smart cities, and digital participation. Welcome, Martin. Hello. And we have Professor Dr. Thomas Deschelan, Professor of Political Science at the Faculty of Social Sciences, University of Ljubljana. His research covers citizenship of young people, political participation of youth, political institutions and youth, quality of youth work, youth program evaluation, citizenship education. He acts as an expert consultant policy advisor to several national governments, organizations for security and cooperation in Europe, European Youth Forum, the International IDEA, European Commission, EACA, Council of Europe, ICF, WYG, and many more bodies. Uh, his recent work is dedicated to the quality of online learning and the support to it. Welcome, Tomas. Hi, thank you. Very good. It's about time to try to engage our participants and our audience as well. We know that we are talking about digital transformation. so. It's a concept that is growing and spreading more and more. Some definitions are coming. So someone is defining digital transformation as a multi-stakeholder process, a change in the mindset, a change in the ways, 
and are they coming? Digital transformation is the integration of digital technology to enhance the teaching and learning experience. It's the process of using digital technologies to create a new or to change a process. In the European youth field, so let's now it down to that, digital transformation is understood as a multi-stakeholder and inclusive process. Someone of our audience did their homework and quoted the official definition, uh, encompassing the co-design, implementation, and utilization of people-centered digital technologies with and by young people, youth workers, and other relevant stakeholders. Digital transformation changes the way most areas of the youth field operate. Digital transformation describes the evolving integration of digital technologies into social, economic, and cultural processes and structures. The whole definition, which is longer than this, can be found on Saltopi resource pool. Okay, but now it's time to get to our guests and speakers. And the first one of the question would be a different question for everybody of you, picking up a bit from your background and your history that you briefly summarize in your presentation slide. Uh, so I would start um, asking to Alicia. Uh, uh, considering, Alicia, that you've been part of uh, Salto P advisory board, you'll be uh, leading the process. And this led eventually to this definition of digital transformation that you just uh, have the chance to, to read. My first curiosity would be how much of what you heard from coming from participant is, uh, is matching this uh, official definition, so to say. And anyway, uh, which are the more cri critical and crucial aspects that you would like to underline of that definition that we want to um, really fix as uh, relevant or most relevant points in the definition to keep in mind. Yes, uh, thanks again for having me today. I mean, this is critical to have these type of uh, events where we get a chance to talk about digital transformation and when we open up this discussion, and especially when it comes to the definition, which in its sense, it is, it is the idea of the definition was um, for it to be open-ended. So it is there for you to have the overall structure and see at what we've got, but also for you to be able to contextualize it within your setting. So all of the things that were covered uh, in the Mentimeter were perfectly fine, you know, because the transformation takes place within so many different areas of, I mean, if not all areas of our lives within the organizations that we worked uh, with, you know, within the, the practical changes, how we operate, and also within the cultural and social norms, the way we see and interact with one another. So the changes are happening everywhere. So I guess it's just a case of uh, emphasizing that it isn't just about um, the processes that we can um, see and we can control, but also the, the, the way we um, understand one another and communicate. So all these underlying uh, behaviors that are sort of linked to all of these processes, you know. Um, so I think uh, it's it's been a fascinating process over the last two years to learn from the experts all over the Europe uh, to, to, to understand what different people's understanding are of digital transformation and as you can imagine it's just a, such a huge term and the idea of what transformation is what is transformative what isn't transformative it's in itself a, a huge challenge so i would say that if you just go back to the definition and take a quick look at the different areas that we identify and just um, have a look at um, just, just the, even just the titles and the headlines and think about what they mean to you. I think that would be a good start to, to think about digital transformation in a strategic way and think about the little transformations that happen within your project around, digit, around the use of digital technologies. Um, so I think there is uh, there is the importance of finding the balance between applying that um, framework, 
but also understanding that each and one of your project is going to be very different and that we cannot be super rigid with um, one particular theory. Uh, so, because uh, each one of us has totally different experiences. Um, so I'm not sure if this answers your questions and I don't think there is a specific uh, theme that I should underline because I think all of them are equally important to ensure that digital transformation is inclusive, participatory, you know, all of these themes, education, access, infrastructure, strategy, ethics, sustainability, all of these are so important. Uh, that it would be very difficult for me to say, oh, this is the most important one. Um, so I would say all of them are important. Thank you, Alicia. And of course, the invitation for everybody is to go check the link participation pool. Some graphic recording is coming. So thank you, Dapse, for this inclusive participatory underlying things. And definition is open-ended. These are the key elements of this first question that we got. Now, I want to involve Martin asking him about uh, a perspective which is more like focused uh, on the field of youth. And so I wanted to ask you what uh, has been already digitally transformed in youth work, uh, in your experience and up to which level, let's say. Uh, I know that the COVID uh, situation had an impact of that, but also from before, there was a change ongoing. And uh, so it's probably interesting to see the perspective of someone being involved in this ongoing change of about what is uh, being and has been digitally transformed in the youth field so far. Martin, please. Hey, um, but yeah, you know me for a while. Uh, you know, I, I, I like to argue about stuff. Um, <laughs> so maybe a brief derailing from your question. It's the first time that I looked uh, closer at uh, the new definition. And what, what really uh, stuck out to me from, from what I read, uh, read or what you read uh, uh, to us was it said it seems to, uh, uh, well, it's a very empowering uh, uh, definition. There's a lot of stuff that you can do or that should be done. Uh, but it also suggests a level of control of, on the process of digital transformation that I don't necessarily see. Not in use work and also not in how we've done so far. Um, I remember 10 years ago in the European Youth Forum with a lot of backlash from organizations that were really resistant and hesitant to start uh, um, working on digital topics or uh, even to take positions uh, towards a digital agenda for young people because they felt that was conflicting with their youth work. And I think the, the fruits of these kind of attitudes have been, been, been reaped uh, with a pandemic because then a lot of organizations and especially the, the structured youth work, um, me personally coming from Germany, uh, we faced that a lot of youth clubs simply lost completely the contact to their target group because they didn't have digital communication channels set up. And when the kids don't come to you anymore, they were completely lost on uh, how to how to involve them. Um, and I think uh, the digital transformation is a process that is ongoing, but that is fairly self-sufficient uh, to a way when it comes uh, to, to society. And uh, we are trying to, to claim more and more control over it. Um, and yes, I think there's a few fields. Um, we've been trying to uh, support that through policy making uh, over the last years, but policy process is always slow. Um, use work has uh, tried quite a few different fields, but I think work, youth work still needs to, to look deeper as, uh, at uh, what kind of different target groups are emerging now with the interconnected world with people having simply the possibility to do everything completely from home, uh, how the communication changed young people um, and the interests of young people. And um, we, at least uh, the German statistics show that participation in traditional youth work is declining constantly over the last decades. Um, and uh, that we are, st we are still trying to fill the gaps and find the needs of young people nowadays, uh, competing with a lot of different uh, factors that are not all necessarily digital, uh, but are often also linked to, to the digital sphere. Um, yeah, and so digital transformation, of course, it is complex. Um, and uh, I think use, use process in digital transformation is often thought as a byproduct uh, and not much uh, as a, a as one of the leading factors, even though if you look at new upcoming booming networks, everything that is hot and new on the internet always has been led by young people, driven by young people uh, that uh, 
platform brought forward these products. I mean, a year, two years ago was big TikTok. Um, by now it's uh, conquered by, basically by the marketing. We are still looking what the next big thing is uh, here, but basically it will be probably where the young people are going first and uh, where all the money will follow. So uh, I think uh, we have these dynamic processes in the transformation processes. Um, and youth workers really struggling to to catch up and to stay close to to where the level is at where young people are co communicating, are gathering, and uh, would be willing to to make their mark. Thank you, Marty. Thank you very much. Passing now to Thomas, being a professor at university, of course, you had. Uh, First end uh, observation of what uh, was the impact uh, of the COVID time on, uh, let's say, the formal education system in a way. Uh, so, how much uh, the, the digital transformation was somehow boosted in that sector, but uh, your connection to the youth field and the amount of work and research you did uh, connected to the youth field is also maybe able to draw us a bridge of uh, what. Is there in common between the two worlds that we are always op um, hoping and trying to get together? And uh, specifically for uh, the formal system, what happened there and uh, at what level we are in terms of transformation, which are the issues and so on? Please, Tomas. Thank you. Thank you for the floor. Uh, you're right. I mean, uh, what I'll try to um... Well, uh, explained today will be uh, on the basis of uh, me having several hats, I guess, wearing several hats uh, during my career and also at this moment. So it's true, I'm actually a youth researcher, uh, also a professor of political science, um, and I teach or also courses related to youth. Uh, but at the same time, I also held several managerial positions at the higher education institutions, and I built quite some uh, several, basically, systems of quality. So uh, I will share my experience on the, uh, on the basis of having um, this background. I mean, uh, for sure, it's, it's good to look at other fields, um, it, even though you're focused on, on youth and youth sector, for sure, because uh, I guess other fields uh, have been, particularly in the past and will be, I guess, that's the political reality, more privileged than uh, the youth sector. And uh, higher education was one of them. Yeah, it's true that higher education is also the source of knowledge and, and, and the incubator of knowledge, as is um, uh, the youth sector and youth organizations. Because uh, it's true, I mean, they are the incubators of like participation, democracy, the way we utilize systems. But at the same time, the higher education also develops them. And you would think that, I mean, everything was great or is great uh, in that sector, but it's not. Yeah, it's true. Uh, we had the experience of like vast amounts of money being poured in into the higher education and digitalization of higher education even prior to pandemic. It proved that, uh, I mean, it was useful to some degree, but by, by no means we were there. And then uh, the pandemic clearly alerted us to this, because uh, it's true that in some fields or in some areas where like the higher education and the formal education because of its privileged position is a bit more advanced. Uh, but in some ways, uh, it's way more um, um, uh, deprived, I would say, and particularly because of that privileged position, because uh, if you lack sources, you, 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 ki you kind of gain skills to actually do something with, with little resources or, with no, or uh, with no resources. And this is where youth fields excels and higher education doesn't, right? Uh, so, um, I mean, the, the level of uh, trend, digital transformation, if we're talking about this, and if we follow, let's say, the, 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 the general definition, um, I mean, uh, is uh, uh, by no way uh, uh, achieved. And uh, I would say that um, we have a lot of advanced systems for the sake of having them. For example, we have like many really advanced softwares, tools, 
and we basically have not appropriated them in the way uh, they were in, in initially designed or appropriated in some other areas. For example, there's a vast influx of business tools uh, into well uh, the the higher education, and then I I see that also into the NGO sector, into the youth field, uh, with ideas that the same logic will work there. It won't. It won't because it's the the the, the nature of functioning and the purpose of those sectors is totally different. So we have a lot of that, and obviously higher education is privileged with number of tools that basically don't work and we pay a lot for them. Uh, there's a lot of techno determinism, for example. Uh, people believe that uh, tech tools will solve everything. They just uh, add additional problems to it. Um, and then uh, I guess uh, I would say capacity is the biggest problem. Capacity to know what technology can do for you and what it can't, right? And, uh, and, and in general, this is where we suffer greatly, and this is what the pandemic also clearly revealed. And I'll give you one more example, and then then I'll end. Uh, so uh, I would say the, the the I would say key feature or a key orientation for higher education, particularly within the European higher education area, is student-centered learning. So student-centered learning is something which is, I would say, a, 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 a quite a big transformation from teacher-centered teacher learning, right? And it's a standard. We're nowhere there yet, uh, even in, in the physical spaces and in, with, with offline teaching, we're nowhere there yet. Obviously, digital tools, tools help you to be focused more on the student, on uh, his or her motivation, on the way they are learning, doing, and obviously like technology can enhance this opportunity uh, for you as an educator to actually achieve certain goals. But what we did was we just transformed offline teacher-centered teaching and learning into online teacher-centered teaching and learning, where basically Zoom became a tool to turn on and to turn off the way you basically do your lectures, right? Without having an idea that there are some tools that can help you to do something that physical spaces simply cannot, right? So I would say higher education suffer from the same problems suffers from the same problems as uh, youth sector does, but I would say in, and in addition to uh, one of the biggest problems there and then the opportunities for youth sector actually is the fact that higher education was privileged with a lot of resources and therefore a thought that the resources will solve the problems. Youth field knows it has to be inventive to actually do something and therefore is way more uh, or way better equipped and prepared for digital transformation than higher education is. Thank you very much, Tomas, also for this really uh, new perspective that you brought uh, from, from the inside. Uh, so I wanted now to uh, involve uh, Mateusz as well. Uh, there's coming from an organization whose uh, first letters in the name uh, stand for digital youth, no, sorry, uh, developing, wow, developing youth participation. So developing youth participation in times of digital transformation, here we go, uh, is what I wanted to ask you about. So what's your experience dealing with participation uh, in a field as this one with the difficulties and the opportunities and the situations that you are going to, to tell us you faced uh, in the, the last years for sure, but also uh, maybe making a bit of comparison to what happened or was happening before. Please, Mateusz. Starting from a bit before the, uh, the pandemic, we were already researching the topics of digital youth participation and starting with, with some, um, some, some research, some mapping, some good practices in this area. But uh, in the Pal Network, we are still at the, we're at the beginning of the process, I would say. And uh, with the pandemic starting really um, out of nowhere for everyone, uh, I think um, we faced the same difficulties as any other organization. So to adjust our work that consists mostly of, uh, of providing 
capacity building opportunities, trainings, partnership building activities, and developing youth participation at local level to some digital world using the digital means that we have and we don't really know about. And I think it's it's then when we um, realize that the tools that are at our disposal are already there and uh, they provide us with plenty of opportunities for enhancing digital youth participation. Since then, uh, in Deeper Network, we are mapping the mm, digital tools, the games, the gamification tools that can improve digital youth participation or uh, youth participation in decision-making processes um, in general. But we are also trying to define what is a digital youth participation and youth e-participation, so uh, in the sense of e-governance, and we are trying to map the um, opportunities and the threats that it brings. So um, with, with this general idea of uh, what we are, are and have been doing in the recent years, I would say that um, digital youth participation is a uh, is a space that can improve, enhance traditional means of youth participation, just like um, digital transformation improves the traditional ways of uh, of work, the traditional ways of thinking. Um, in this sense, for example, um, when establishing a youth participatory budget in Portimao, where are our headquarters in Portugal, we we're already preparing to use a digital youth participation tool uh, to improve this process, to allow young people to for easier voting on general ideas, to discuss the ideas, to propose the ideas using some digital tools. And in the time when they couldn't actually meet in person, this was a perfect space um, to, to still keep their engagement and participation um, online. And this kind of opportunities, um, I would say, improve um, a lot the processes of digital youth participation, uh, the processes of youth participation in decision-making processes um, in general, but they have to be guided. So young people have to be informed how they can participate in those spaces. We cannot assume that they have already all the necessary means and all the necessary skills to participate in, in digital um, digital spaces, digital tools um, comfortably. And those processes have to be blended. So what we are focusing on is always to uh, use both online and digital space when establishing a youth participation um, process. Thank you, Mateusz. Uh, I want to bring you on the topic of the youth work community now and the youth work field. What could be, in your opinion, the more relevant path to follow as youth work community? What would be uh, a to-do list for the youth workers uh, to put themselves more steadily on the path of digital transformation and uh, what attention in the same time they should have? We heard already something. Uh, I want to pick up, for instance, what Thomas said about uh, not thinking that resources and uh, platforms and technologies alone can help you to solve the problem. Sometimes they become the problem. For sure, there are more. So um, I invite you all to yeah, share your ideas and point of views about this. What can be our suggestion to the youth work community to put themselves more steadily on the path of digital transformation and be aware of possibly some issues? I'm happy to start please, since I was please, uh, please. the last one, the, the first one before. So just to give everybody a rest. Um, but before I go into the question, can I just quickly kind of um, go back to what we've discussed briefly and just to kind of link it to digital transformation? Because from the discussions, the discussion that we've had so far, it feels like we've discussed three things around, you know, uh, Martin talked about control of related to the digital transformation um, framework. And then we talked a little bit about the understanding of, you know, the different activities within the digital transformation and some sort of um, strategic thinking as to what kind of tools should be used and how we could approach them. And I see that the digital transformation framework in a sense is trying to in a, a approach 
all of these um, um, confusions or, or address, in a sense, these problems that we discuss very often. So when we talk about control in terms of, you know, thinking of digital transformation framework as a, as a, as a way to control, I would actually reframe it and think about um, agency. You know, what is uh, young people's agency at the moment when it comes to digital transformation and who is in charge of what uh, when it comes to digital youth work and um, who has the control of the processes and the ownership of the data of, you know, of, of the. So when we think about the multi stakeholders processes and the way digital transformation is taking place. It's not about limited in any way because it is about um, cultivating the uh, the spirit of innovation and you know uh, people centeredness, but to kind of ensuring that it is about people centered values and it is uh, in a way that young people are kind of treated as human beings. So even if they do decide to uh, use TikTok, uh, they do it um, in a um, in. In, in a manner that uh, allows them to understand who they become as young young people, you know, as adults. And I think, uh, so I think it's it's just the first step. It's only the first approach to get to understanding digital transformation. So these are early steps, but I see like that we've, with the group of people that we've worked with, we are sort of slowly trying to kind of cover that list uh, with the framework. So, um, so that's just to, uh, and also thinking about the gray area of youth work and how there isn't really a space there to uh, create applications that are going just to say, oh, this is what we do within the non-formal non -formal education, because it is the gray area where we are using apps that are, oh, we we're just going to use that and this, and this is, whereas the non formal educational sector has some sort of um, policies in place uh, and definitely sort of in lots of investment such as you know Microsoft schools Google schools uh, and all of that um, so I just wanted to refer to that point from from the perspective of the framework and I would uh, invite everybody also to, um, to to check the participation and information resource pool where you can find resources for all of these different he headings, you know, where when it comes to innovation, to education and skills, we have tried our best to map the different resources that are out there um, for, for all of those different areas, but you are welcome to add your resources as well. And now back to the question, when it comes to the youth work community and moving forward with the uh, digital transformation, this is actually a very interesting question because I have just worked on this publication uh, and the research paper around the limits of digital youth work. And it was very, it, it wasn't a pleasant experience because I had to really go in deep and think about all the limitations and the things that might go wrong and uh, kind of trying to be very realistic as to uh, what, uh, are the things that we shouldn't be doing when it comes to you know moving forward with digital uh, digital transformation, and I think one of the things uh, was uh, and that was a big one was to accept that some things might well just cannot happen using digital technologies. So some values that are intrinsic to youth work will remain the same, and they do have to stay the same. No matter, so we can't use that uh, tech solution as like uh, Thomas said. Uh, the other things that are moving forward for the tech um, youth community, I would say, and also I can share the link to that paper. You don't need to read it all, it's a long paper. But there is a podcast. Yes, there is a podcast. So you can listen to the podcast. We talked about uh, the importance of rethinking the way uh, we we think about what it means to be uh, a, a youth work team. Yeah. And the interdisciplinary aspect of youth work team. So if you're using digital technologies, so many new uh, uh, concepts are coming into the place, you know ethics, uh, what about someone's human rights, their well-being, and you really can't expect one youth worker to have expertise on all of this. So it's thinking about new ways to create multidisciplinary teams, new systems or networks of support where youth workers get that kind of support, and they're not expected to do all the training themselves and to constantly improve themselves. So thinking about the new approaches to lifelong um, support education. So I think it's finding a new ways to support the youth work community and for the youth work community to support one another 
but not necessarily to expect individual youth workers to empower themselves and to just like chase the digital transformation because I think that might be unrealistic. And so it's it's finding a way to support. Thank you, Alicia. Let's see if someone is willing to pick up what you said and go a step further or anyway, add something to the discussion. Thomas, please. It's actually a good question. and It doesn't only um, relate to multi-stakeholderism. It actually relates to, I guess, all the processes uh, in a way digital transformation will touch when it comes to uh, the youth field. I think we need to stick to the basics, right? If like participation is one of the key principles, let's look that the participation level stay as wide as possible, or at least we don't actually diminish this. And then empowerment, inclusion, respect. So these are like the basics that have to be kind of ticked in order to actually have a clear sense of, um, in, in order to be, I would say, reassured that we're doing a kind of uh, enhancement exercise rather than transformation exercise for the fake, for the sake of transformation. So I guess what we do otherwise needs to be enhanced. And I guess like uh, the, this blendedness and then um, um, that, that was actually talked about before is, is a clear example of that. So, I mean, where we struggle, uh, this, uh, this is where like these tools and then these processes can actually help. Where we don't, why would you why would we try to fix something which is working well you know so i think we need to stick to the basis ask the key questions what are the pro problems we're actually addressing because let's be serious i mean uh, we're all in a way at some points in 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 our like lives privileged with benefiting from certain programs that are designed the way they are designed and obviously, uh, digital transformation is currently also high on the priority agenda of the recovery plans across the member states, right? And then money is going to come, right? And uh, let's try to focus on the problems that we have in order to fix them and rather than basically just spending the money that will come anyway. So uh, it's true. I mean, uh, I, I think the key challenge here is actually for the organizations as well as individuals to stay focused on their missions and enhance their missions. It's not always easy. Um, we've had past um, experience with, for example, Erasmus Plus oriented, orienting too much on the employability. And what some youth organizations became was employment agencies. That's not their mission, you know, and, it, and I feel we are in a way also confronted with this kind of uh, dangers and then this is why it's very clear it has to be very clear for individuals organizations and as well as the key stakeholders in the process to stick to the basics what the youth work is there for what are they trying to do and which problems are actually addressing and if they're going to do that if they're going to check this I think then we're on, on, on a good path. Thank you, Tomas. And uh, yeah, Mateusz and Martin, from the field now, <laughs> I want to do really hear opinions from you. Mateusz, please. If I can catch up a bit on what Tomas was saying, things that are working, I think the, the, the opportunity of digital transformation is that we can still improve them because sometimes we don't even in we don't know their full potential unless we try to improve them and we experiment a bit for example um i mean we had to transfer our partnership building activities online which were working perfectly well uh, before the pandemics but suddenly people from very distant areas uh, remote places islands that couldn't afford the traveling to our activities started connecting to those activities and we could we could improve what was already uh, working very well. But I also completely agree on that. Uh, there is a threat that with the new money coming to the, to the programs, uh, organizations will more and more focus on creating digital tools uh, that are 
um, well, first, not always very well thought through, and secondly, uh, are very often a waste of money. Uh, one of the big reflections of our uh, study sessions on developing youth participation, youth e-participation that we are holding in, in the past two years were, were, was that there are already tools that you can use. There are tools for everything, digital, digital tools for everything. It's just a matter of combining them in an efficient way uh, to facilitate any process. Coming a bit more to what I wanted to say, answering your question, uh, Michael, uh, was that for, for me, there are a few directions in which youth work needs to uh, focus and, and work in the uh, few next years. It's, as Alicia was saying, a safe environment for young people to, to participate in this digital world uh, in terms of framework and their skills to participate safely, uh, also taking into account their future and what they are leaving as a footprint in the internet and the cybersecurity and data that they're processing. It's about building the capacity of young people and youth workers, how to be a part of digital world and how to use the tools and how to reach out uh, in an inclusive way to those who are uh, now um, excluded from the digital spaces. It's about creating uh, principles of quality youth work in different areas using the digital tools because they are a bit uh, different than a traditional youth work principles. For example, in one of our reports, we are, um, we are creating with participants 10 principles of uh, youth e-participation. I think it's, it's really worth uh, reading because it's simple, but, uh, but uh, quite a good reflection on it. Um, it's about also creating a space and providing a space for young people to be part of the processes that create frameworks for using uh, digital tools and for digital transformation. For example, now we are trying to put in frameworks uh, where uh, the development of artificial intelligence that will strongly influence the young people's future. And we need to be sure that young people are part of this discussion and not only the high commissioners or big corporations who are working on it right now. Thank you, Mateusz. Martin, want to add something on this? Uh, certainly. Um, I, I agree quite a bit uh, with what the previous uh, speaker said. Um, I think we, we should look back into, uh, at, at the values that we always promoted with youth work, with non formal education. Um, we have a set of core values that we want to promote, and uh, I often feel that when we are designing digital offers, yes, we're putting tools first, or we just uh, um, are looking at uh, feasibility of what can we actually accomplish. Um, but I do believe a lot of what we did with our use work offers was linked to the physical space, to the experience of uh, seeing each other face to face. Uh, the whole digitization of our communication and our interactions has changed quite a lot. Uh, in the needs of young people in, in their ways of how they uh, want to be approached. And I think that is often not really uh, registered in, in when we design offers. And it brings me back to, to uh, the discussion that, uh, that I had with uh, Alicia earlier here, uh, already. And I would re reject this notion of that you can, what I, say, I spoke about when I, I said control with agency, because agency would require an amount or a level of power uh, in the decision-making that you first need to have, that you need to be able to claim. Um, and as long as we are sticking to the popular tools, as we are sticking to the TikToks that uh, are having very questionable uh, exchanges uh, for data that are putting us through, uh, um, through the uh, um, algorithms into tiny bubbles that feed us more and more of the same information or often uh, misinformation. Um, if you're sticking to the popular tools, this th thing again is streamed on Facebook. And I remember uh, in, 2007, I think, uh, uh, Facebook, uh, uh, how many people I put on Facebook. And that was our go-to tools to keep people connected after the use exchange. And it worked beautifully for two or three years. And by now, uh, there are surveys where the Facebook asks the users, um, do they think Facebook is contributing to the good of the world? And no, majority of users is disagreeing, thinks Facebook actually makes the world a worse place. 
yes, A, we are streaming here. B, most of us probably still have a Facebook account. Yes, there's a lot of tools available. They have potential, but I think when it comes to agency or when it comes to control, I think we need to find a way on how to claim these spaces and multi-stakeholder approaches technically are in space. Uh, I spent 10 years bringing young people into the UN government, uh, internet governance uh, processes, sending young gr uh, youth groups together so they can speak to Facebook, Google, and so on, but also the uh, stakeholders on the national level, the people that host the infrastructure. But even our policymakers are quite lost in these policymaking spaces uh, uh, when it comes to the internet. And so to find where is that space for agency for young people, I think it's very difficult to even find a space uh, to ex uh, exercise that right, uh, to, to uh, lift this participation, to make these conscious choices, uh, let alone the, the lack of information that we, that we can get. We can get that lack of information, but uh, how to claim these spaces um, and make sure that we actually have participatory choices uh, in the digital transformation process. I think that is uh, the bigger obstacle that we we need to face. And th th that's why I've talked about control and not so much about ag agency. As I said, it sounds very emancipatory, but I think we, we need to look stronger at what our options actually are. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin, for this uh, contribution. I would say that probably over the last two years, I have been primarily uh, working with digital literacy skills of youth workers, uh, and I have been in the space of young people, but I would definitely say that uh, the people in this panel who directly work with the young people themselves have better knowledge than I do. So I'm just going to cover uh, some of the knowledge that I have from the research perspective, but um, to have like really, uh, you know, grounded uh, knowledge in practice, I would say that the people who are working directly with young people are probably the best source of knowledge. Um, but uh, uh, from from my experience, I would say that uh, it, it, there has been a, a, an interesting shift in uh, the sudden interest of digital literacy um, learning out of a sudden me as a as a as a digital literacy uh, practitioner, I have had lots of work over this entire period, uh, kind of trying to create uh, courses and workshops which uh, touched upon sort of these more nuanced issues around disinformation and digital, critical digital literacy and the, the, the political aspect of digital literacy. So um, not necessarily just, well, not just, but using the safe password, but actually thinking more critically about the digital uh, literacy um, as a as a part of your everyday existence in democracy in, 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 a, in a democratic world. And I think uh, that to me uh, was a, a positive sign that we were able to find that time and to discuss this. And also seeing that there was um, lots of resources to put into um, you know, training for youth workers uh, was, was a good sign. Um, but I think it's uh, it's really hard to, to say uh, from my experience uh, as to um, where the digital literacy levels of young people are at just now. So I won't be able to answer this question and I'm not going to pretend that I know uh, because I think this is a very big question. Meanwhile, other one wants to say something about this, how we could maybe facilitate the process of increasing uh, the skills. Uh, I, I would uh, Please. jump in. Um, Please, Martin. Also, don't want to uh, claim to holistically answer to the question. I think there's uh, statistics in the making out there uh, that will do much better job. I can say that in the German, uh, uh, there, there's a big German study, the gym uh, studies, uh, which is uh, having representative uh, surveys uh, amongst uh, 12, uh, 13 to 25 year olds, or thir uh, 13 to 18 year olds, uh, depending on, on what question. Um, and generally, uh, what has increased is uh, the awareness of topics, um, but uh, what doesn't necessarily shine through is really a background knowledge uh, when it comes to depth. Uh, when, for example, people are aware of issues of hate speech, but do not know how to combat it. Uh, um, they are aware of uh, password protection, the responsibilities, but they do not necessarily see the situation that they have to act on it. Um, so there's not necessarily this connection um, that is also pretty clear in uh, um, 
how the grants are going. So in Germany, for example, we have a lot of grants that are uh, linked to um, media literacy, uh, all kinds of uh, grants, but they only started in the second year of the pandemic as a response to a, a severe lack of these kind of offers uh, beforehand. So A, it was delayed, and B, now a lot of actors kind of jump on the topics that are already well established, that have a lot of resources out there while new topics are still underdeveloped. Um, as a bit of anecdotal, uh, anecdotal evidence, because that I definitely can claim, I think, uh, from my uh, use work practice, um, I see that uh, the social divide in, in terms of digital divide of who understands better the devices and who doesn't, um, economics seem to play an increasing role. Uh, the uh, the, the um, pandemic has deepened that gap. Um, kids that grew up uh, in households with only one computer that had to be shared with the parents were quite cut off uh, devices that are not up to uh, the current technology uh, standards will cut them off from messengers, from games, and so on. Um, and I lead uh, events where we are using video games. I see, for example, that kids do not have the same uh, competencies in using video games that others and already falling there behind, increasing to, to the amount of stress that they have on them when we are creating competitive settings on that. And this amounts always to, to, to the level of frustration tolerance. So this gap, uh, even in these very accessible offers, uh, plays a big role. And it starts very early on. And I think right now, economic uh, distribution plays a very significant role. And uh, I think that might have uh, been yeah, pointed out stronger uh, during the pandemic uh, than it was before already. Yeah, so we, I'm going to talk on the basis of the research that we did, and it was on representative sample of Slovenian youth between 15 and um, 29, actually. Uh, um, and we looked at also uh, at the way they, um, well, consume uh, technology. And uh, when it came to digital tools, it was clear that obviously they, they are um, the consumption part is, is high, whether production part is not so high. And then this then also related to the competence related to it. And uh, particularly when we talk about, let's say, youth, uh, the digital spaces and so on, and uh, trustworthiness and, and credibility of them, uh, we clearly identified that um, uh, they lack capacity of uh, or competencies in uh, evaluating whether something is trustworthy or credible or not. For example, this was clear. Uh, it, they also lack capacity of understanding the challenges of the utilization of different tools. This was all, all, also clear. Um, in, in general, obviously, more we looked at the production level then the, uh, the, uh, the numbers dropped also uh, heavily. But uh, what I would like to actually point out, and this is that actually a result coming out of the eighth, uh, eighth cycle of youth dialogue, uh, which was oriented on youth spaces, and it was like digital as well as uh, offline, it was clear that, um, and, and this has been said before during this uh, discussion, uh, what young people actually identified is, uh, and then this was kind of um, um, uh, a question about what do they think they need in order to improve, uh, let's say, the levels of participation, uh, their voice and so on. They clearly identified the need to elevate their capacity in using the existing places, uh, also online, rather than the, the creation of new ones. So this was very clear, yeah? Elevate capacity, also improve the safety and other elements of existing places um, or like youth, youth online spaces uh, and refrain from creation of new ones, even though it is clear, and this was clear also uh, in their research, that they know that basically the main tools are dominated by, by um, well, are basically owned by private corporations, which have other motives, which is like revenue um, elevation. And obviously, uh, youth are not shareholders. So basically, they know about it. They, 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 they understand this bit, but obviously how to circumvent the fact that at the end of the day, they will probably still use it. Um, uh, and, 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 and 
in order to get the capacity to do that. This is very clearly already an alarm uh, when they are asked about it. So I would say capacity, 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 actually. Thank you, Tomas. Maybe you want to add something more or Alicia wanted, uh, oh, Mateus, I see it's unmuting, so please. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on what Thomas was saying. There is also this uh, study. It's it's about to be updated in a month from Eurostat, being young people in Europe today, uh, where the reflection was exactly what, what Thomas was saying, that young people, over 90% of young people participate in digital world. They are using the tools, they're using the social media, but in terms of their actual skills to do it confidently and to use uh, digital tools for other purposes. Um, they are definitely not experts and they have a potential to learn, but but uh, at the moment, not very high skills to do it, uh, to participate. And I think uh, here is the, the part of the capacity that we need to build uh, in youth work. It's the capacity not only of youth workers to to use the digital tools and in youth work and do it in a quality way, but also to improve the capacity of young people and have in mind that they don't uh, have it to, they don't have it for granted. And also the same competences we need to improve among youth workers in terms of how to, um, how to include young people who are uh, nowadays not part of the digital world, not part of the digital youth work because, for example, of lack of means of lack, or lack of uh, capacity to, to take part in it. I think it's uh, our role and role of decision makers to grant young people equal access to the digital world and provide them with necessary uh, tools, not only digital tools, but also physical infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mateo. Uh, Alicia maybe still wants to pick up what she was uh, willing to say after the first question, so please. Yeah, I, I think this is a very interesting point that when we talk about digital inclusion and getting people in line, and this was also something that when we started working on the digital transformation concept, you know, there was lots of information out there about digital transformation being the driver for the future, for the customers and for the future of labor. So you would always see digital transformation as this thing where we need to prepare you know, young people to be the workers, the buyers of the future. We, we need them to you know, just buy and work, buy and work. And so very often we need to recognize this idea that when we get people, when we, it's very important to get young people, to get them the employability skills and to get them the right digital literacy skills, which many young people lack, you know, and they're obviously, I've worked on the studies, maybe not recently, about two years ago, for sure, where there's certainly a gap, you know, the uh, division between young people who use digital um, phone, well, smartphones just for, for social media, but they're unable to create their CVs or apply for jobs or, you know, so, um, so, so there's definitely that digital divide. So I would say that when we think about digital literacy, it isn't just about getting people online and helping them to submit an application to apply for a job, which is important, but it is about ensuring that we talk about this meaningful digital inclusion, which is about gaining the digital literacy skills that allow you to exist as a sort of um, uh, an informed citizen in the digital transformation process. And this is also the way the framework is trying to show the different areas that are important for you as a citizen uh, to know the different areas of the transformations that are happening around you. And I think we also have to think about digital literacy as this, um, uh, it's important. Digital literacy is uh, extremely important for us to be able to navigate uh, and it's lifelong learning. And it isn't uh, something that we might just learn and we might get uh, one course and that's going to be us fixed for the rest of our lives because digital transformation is an ongoing process and digital skills will be changing. So digital literacy 
uh, should be sort of in between different disciplines and in between different topics and essentially it's everything that we do right from disinformation to tracking our run with a smartwatch if we can afford one i don't uh and then you know all of these uh, other things uh but one thing to bear in mind and, and i'll just finish with that is that we also cannot use digital literacy as uh, something that uh, would fix all of the issues, right? Because there was, uh, uh, I experienced something recently when we, when I, when I talked to um, to someone in, in in the field about, uh, you know, how do we use digital literacy to um, to, to protect uh, girls from gender based violence, right? And this was a bit of a a, a tricky situation there because girls might sort of uh, learn some behaviors to protect themselves, but it's not their responsibility to protect themselves from gender-based violence online. You know, we shouldn't be blaming the victim for it. So, it's, so no amount of digital literacy will protect me from being abused by someone on Twitter or by getting hacked by someone who is highly super, you know, an amazing hacker. So I guess, we also have to understand the limit of limits of digital literacy and uh, uh, and sort of frame that within within the the systems that are in place uh, as well. If that makes sense, if I'm not making it overly philosophical, and if I do, then I'm sorry. But I'm happy to have a conversation <laughs> about this afterwards. So um, so that's that's my that's what I wanted to add to this conversation. Uh, so anything to add so far to what we were discussing? Yes, Martin, please. How do you think uh, that communicators can work on social media to foster inclusion and diversity? I also wanted to come back to that. I do believe that we are living in a very polarized uh, uh, social media environment. Um, and I think a big obstacle that you can put in front of yourself is trying to reach everybody. Uh, instead, I would strongly suggest that you are trying to foster a safe space uh, through strong moderation and to make sure that your target group is represented in that space that you're creating and uh, prevent it from harm, that you have somebody that is able to filter out all the problematic comments uh, and engage actively in discussions that are ongoing. Uh, but do not try to uh, uh, make it open for everybody, find everybody's uh, approval uh, through these channels. That is not uh, going to work, but rather uh, make it focused and make sure that it has a strong voice that will be reshared uh, re and reshareable also in other contexts uh, where you will lose con uh, um, control over the contents that you're giving. Uh, so that's also something that you might uh, want to consider when you're working online with public channels, that your information will travel to places where you lose control and you're not uh, able to, to put always a context to what you're writing. Um, so just a few words of, of uh, caution, but I think uh, if you want to make a channel, um, I personally worked a lot with Discord, where you have a lot of control who's in your Discord ch uh, channels and who you work with. Um, but if you have a public profile, Instagram, TikTok, whatever, um, you will probably uh, um, also have to uh, try to ensure that you have a backup uh, network that we are using. That's what we're using with uh, um, what we're calling it in Gaming Antifa channel. Uh, in Gaming Antifa, we are having a, ne a backup network of uh, supporters that if somebody uh, is getting attacked, uh, they will have uh, people to talk to. They have uh, um, support uh, either online or also informally in the group so that you're having also a kind of uh, a backup because community management nowadays can be really exhausting uh, if you leave it to a single person. Thank you very much, Martin, for sharing this uh, insights and practical knowledge as well. I have a last question. The question is, how do you think that political parties and governments can influence or support the process of digital transformation? And do you find any difference between a conservative and non-conservative governments? Thomas, you said you work with many institutions. So I have to say, uh, I mean, um, from uh, what I can say, and then I'll be basing my my my, my answers, uh, my answer uh, to to the work I've done for the forum on how 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 do you sell youth to political parties, uh, as well as uh, to some other um, uh, literature. I, I would say that like when it comes to the way political parties or I would say political actors uh, operate, 
I didn't see much difference between left or right, you know, or progressive, conservative, uh, however you would frame it. Um, I, I, I have seen, particularly on the left side, progressive left, uh, I mean, it should be all progressive, but nevertheless, more progressive, um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the sense of, let's say, ethics. Are we going too far? Yeah. Are we basically my, uh, using the micro targeting techniques and every every possible uh, element that actually um, new technology allows you to do? Is this something we still, um, in, in general, signed up for? You know, and then particularly like the most the, the parties, the most to the left, try to at least address this issue like ethical issue even though at the in reality they didn't act much differently to others whereas others basically acted just as plain corporations were actually gaining more and more support and this is the way you do it you do micro targeting you sell the information the client in a way once and and and, and this is what you use these tools for uh, what was problematic particularly for me uh, was the fact that even non-populist or originally non-populist, let's say, movements, parties, and so on, started using more and more emotions, right? They weren't trying to build a critical citizen that would actually be able to evaluate information and then make a, an informed decision. They basically fell into a trap of using emotions to, get, to gain support, which can be a good thing this time, but the next time you still have objects rather than subjects, you know, and then basically the next time it won't be you, it will be the other side. And this is where it's very tricky to play with emotions. And here I've seen that even NGOs are starting doing that. So it's, it's, it's a very problematic practice the way I see it, because uh, we forgot and political actors are more and more forgetting the fact that, I mean, at least the, 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 uh, let's say the mainstream ones or the progressive ones, that with like uh, generating support, they sh still should perform their civic education roles. And this means creation of critical citizen, which is so detrimental for democratic society. This is what I see. And then and, and there is a huge trap there, particularly for the organizations as well as in, in a way, we see also certain organizations that actually deliver support to, let's say, um, watchdogs and so on. Uh, they're more and more talking about uh, practice, practices performed by populist um, uh, agents uh, rather than sticking to the main mission, as I said, which is elevating a critical citizen who's capable of evaluating whether an information is fake or true. Uh, so, I mean, it, it's a huge uh, struggle. Uh, we'll see how it goes. I'm not, I'm not so optimistic. I have to be, I know. I have to be, and it's good we have these discussions, but at, at the end of the day, political parties are basically just machines to elevate support, and this is what they're doing online as well. Thank you very much, Thomas. I think that Martin raised his hand to uh, one last contribution. I also find the framing quite particular, but I think uh, our discussion about uh, uh, policies uh, on the, of the digital space is quite, let's say, conservative or reactionary, um, because uh, our policies are talking about citizens as users, usually. Uh, um, we are not talking about citizens uh, uh, online, uh, necessarily, and that is how the entire discussions are framed. We had very few uh, breaks of that. Uh, we had uh, the pirates that joined the Greens in the European Parliament that tried to stir up some discussions um, from a more user-based uh, perspective, but generally discussions are often user versus commerce, user versus surveillance of the state, user versus surveillance of the platform. So when we talk about responsibility, I think we need to find a way on talking about responsibility outside also of this commercial setting, also about who actually will be able to, to take responsibility what was happening on these platforms um, and not 
be bogged down by is that even feasible commercially and maybe that is not the issue um same with surveillance uh, when we talk about oh but we need in the modern times we everything is so digitalized we need to have a certain level of surveillance maybe we don't or maybe then we need to cut down on uh, the access that these apps, apps have there have been alternative concepts there has been open source concepts there have been open access concepts open data in order to give more power to the citizens um, these are concepts that are not super discussed, and I think that is something that we might want to shed an eye to when we want to really uh, talk about more liberal approaches, let's say, um, to these politics. Uh, but right now, um, I think there needs to be, again, this li literacy that we just spoke about earlier amongst decision makers, even on how to frame these issues and break it back down to the citizen. And I think that it's missing in politics a bit here. Thank you very much, Martin. And uh, this brings us to the end of our discussion. Time flies when you have fun and, and, and deal with interesting topics. Meanwhile, I, of course, want to uh, remember to you all the next appointment. There will be uh, another panel uh, coming soon. It will be uh, on uh, November the 8th, same time, same channels, let's say. And the topic will be participation and inclusion in digital transformation. So as you see, one by one, we are picking up all the details that the discussion uh, brings up and try to go deeper into each one of them. So let's open up all the microphones together to make a bit of noise and feedback uh, and uh, feel a bit more humanity in, in the digital transmission of ourselves. And uh, let's say, uh, ciao, goodbye, whatever you want to use as salute to our audience at my one, two, three. Bye. Ciao. Bye. 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 Bye.